Good evening, everybody. I just wanted to do um, a little lecture series on basic meteorology and physics. Uh, and I just kind of want to get my feet wet um, just into presenting lectures and material. Um, one day I do want to become a professor of meteorology and physics. Uh, definitely be an interesting path to embark on. Um, currently, uh, just taking the path of the storm chaser right now and the uh, at home broadcast meteorologist, so it's pretty interesting. But uh, currently, I don't really have much experience on uh, teaching, but I definitely want to be able to um, give you guys some quality information um, just on some basic meteorology. So let's just start. So, lecture one would be um, on the structure and composition of the atmosphere. All right, so let's start. So the Earth's system contains or consists of four different spheres. Um, some say five, but in this lecture, we're going to uh, focus on four of them. First one would be the lithosphere. Uh, this is the rigid outer layer of the Earth. This includes the plastic mantle, the solid mantle, the oceanic crust, and the continental crust. Um, and also includes the crust in the upper portion of the mantle, um, exactly as described there. Moving on, we have the hydrosphere. This is the combined mass of water found on planet Earth. It is estimated that there are 333 million cubic miles of water on our planet. That's a lot of water. It includes groundwater, oceans, lakes, and streams. Interestingly enough, salt water accounts for 97.5% of all water on Earth. Definitely a big number there. And fresh water only accounts for about 2.5% of all water on the Earth. Of that fresh water, 68.9% um, is within the frozen glaciers um, and the ice within the North and South Poles. And approximately 71% of Earth's surface is covered by oceans, which is around 139.5 million square miles, almost 37 times the size of the United States. Definitely a big number there, guys. All right, so let's move on to the biosphere. Definitely a lot of inter uh, interesting information here. Uh, so ba basically, the biosphere is the worldwide combination of ecosystems on Earth. Um, this encompasses around eight and uh, eight point seven million plant and animal species, which is definitely a big number. Um, just the top there just shows a few animals. Uh, the bottom shows a couple plants. Um, it's definitely interesting. Uh, we're definitely going to touch on this um, aspect in a later lecture. Uh, but for now, let's move on to uh, the next sphere, uh, which would be the fourth um, out of the four here. And the fourth sphere is the atmosphere. But basically, it's the layers of gases surrounding our planet. And we will be talking about this in great t uh, detail, um, definitely in this lecture and as well as future lectures. All right, so let's take a look at the energy sources for all of the Earth, uh, for the Earth here. Solar energy, which is interpreted, uh, interpreted as the sun, which is very important for the atmosphere. So radiant light and heat from the sun drives weather systems all across the world. The sun acts as a renewable energy source. Earth receives about 1,360 watts per meter squared of energy from the sun. That is equivalent to about 95,200 lumens per meter squared. And a meter um, is a foot by a foot by a foot. I'm sorry, a foot by a foot. Uh, but since uh, the atmosphere absorbs 26% of the incoming radiation, the sun produces about 70,500 lumens per uh, meter squared. Solar energy can be converted into energy using solar panels. And solar energy is also an integral part of agriculture, crops, which is also um, leads to food generation. Take a look at the second part here. This is the residual heat in the interior of the planet. Um, this is actually not very important for the atmosphere. It is produced by the leftover gravitational energy from the formation of the Earth from the compression of cosmic debris. It resembles a bicycle pump heating up uh, due to compression of the air inside of it. All right, let's take a look at the composition of the atmosphere. So two categories of gases exist in the atmosphere. The first being fixed gases. So the definition of fixed gas um, is a gas in which is labeled as a permanent gas. Um, this includes nitrogen, uh, which com uh, comprises of 78% of the gases of the atmosphere. 
Next would be oxygen, 21% of the gases in the atmosphere. Next is argon, less than 1%, about 0.9% of the gases in the atmosphere. And then carbon dioxide makes 0.04% uh, of the gases in the atmosphere. We also have trace amounts of neon, helium, methane, krypton, as well as hydrogen. The second type um, is variable gases. And we'll take a look at variable gases here. Uh, so basically a definition of a variable gas. Um, so, uh, concentrations vary from time to time and from place to place. This includes water vapor, which is the gaseous phase of water. This is very, very important within the atmosphere. Uh, we will be uh, diving deep and driving home the concepts of water vapor. Uh, the next variable gas that we want to talk about is ozone. So ozone is an inorganic molecule that exists mostly in the stratosphere, which we will go over what the stratosphere is. Formed from uh, dioxygen by the action of ultraviolet light, uh, as well as electrical discharges within Earth's atmosphere. 90% of the ozone exists within the stratosphere. It has several important roles, which includes the absorption of harmful ultraviolet radiation emitted from the sun, plays an important role in the atmosphere's ability to cleanse itself of pollutants, and ozone itself is also a pollutant when it is in high concentration near the surface of the Earth. Next, we're going to take a look at aerosols. So definition, uh, fine solids... Find solid particles or liquid droplets in the air. There's three main types. We have uh, natural inorganic materials, um, such as fine dust, sea salt, and uh, suspended polluted water droplets. We also have natural organic materials, which include smoke, pollen, spores, and bacteria. We also have uh, anthropogenic or man-made products of combustion. We have smoke, ashes, as well as dust. All right, so the evolution of uh, atmospheric oxygen. So the Earth was formed around 4.5 billion years ago, a very long time ago. Uh, the first atmosphere likely consisted of hydrogen, helium, methane, as well as ammonia. So the first atmosphere was lost to space during the bombardment of meteorites and the intense solar wind shortly after the Earth was formed. A new atmosphere eventually formed from the outgassing of volcanoes, um, and other venting activity. Just to show some volcanic activity there. So the second atmosphere uh, was comprised of primarily water vapor, carbon dioxide, as well as nitrogen. But there were only trace amounts of oxygen within this uh, second atmosphere, which is pretty interesting. And this oxygen likely came from the reaction of ultraviolet radiation with water, which splits the water into two hydrogens um, and one oxygen. Oxygen at this time made up about two thousandths of a percent of the atmosphere, which is 100,000 times less than the oxygen we have in the atmosphere today. And photosynthesis evolved between 3.5 and, and 2.7 billion years ago. Photosynthesis evolved first in bacteria, um, called cyanobacteria. So photosynthesis takes in carbon dioxide and gives off oxygen. Rather than build up in the atmosphere, the oxygen formed from photosynthesis uh, would rather have acted, uh, reacted with other substances such as iron to form iron oxide in the rocks and soil of our planet. Eventually though, all the oxidation was essentially complete and the oxygen began to escape and build up within the atmosphere. So between 2.4 and 2 billion years ago, Oxygen levels rose to about one-tenth the value it is today and remained constant for the next 850,000, or sorry, 850 million years. And then oxygen levels began to rise again between 850 million and 300 million years ago. At this point, oxygen levels were actually higher than today, perhaps even as high as 35%. This uh, sort of aspect is kind of scary to some people, especially me. I'm not a big fan of bugs. But this oxygen spike during the Carboniferous period is correlated to finding the fossils of giant insects and amphibians. Certain insects and amphibians rely on the diffusion of oxygen for respiration. And oxygen, oxygen can diffuse uh, further at higher concentrations. Um, even so much so, some dragonflies during this time had wingspans of 30 inches and had bodies that were well over an inch, an inch and a half in diameter. 
That's that would definitely be a scary dragonfly to see that. And you see here sort of a uh bigger millipede or centipede looking guy here. That would definitely be pretty scary as well, you know. The centipedes nowadays are probably about the largest, probably maybe an inch or two long. And uh, considering that the dragonfly's wings here are about 30 inches across, I mean, take that. I mean, you're looking at about, you know, a three foot long centipede, which would be uh, definitely devastating, um, at least to, uh, you know, the, the ways my mind thinks. I couldn't wrap my head around a three foot long centipede. All right, so basically oxygen levels fell to present levels around 21% um, approximately 200 million years ago, which ended the era of giant insects and amphibians. Um, definitely, I'm definitely thankful for that. Definitely wouldn't want to run into um, a giant centipede or a dragonfly. It'd be pretty crazy. So during the evolution of the atmosphere, the amounts of nitrogen remained relatively constant. Uh, this is due to the fact that nitrogen is, a very vol is very volatile in most of its forms. It is unreactive. Uh, with materials that make up the solid earth, and it is very stable in the presence of solar radiation. All right, let's move on to the height and structure of the atmosphere. Definitely an interesting concept. First, we'll talk about pressure. Pressure decreases rapidly with height. This is due to the fact that the amount of air molecules in the air as you increase in altitude, uh, thus decreasing the amount of pressure above you. If the atmosphere were incompressible, or resistant to compression, pressure would change linearly with height. Instead, pressure decreases exponentially with height, and there's no lid on the atmosphere. The edge of the atmosphere is rather arbitrary. You can see this big exponential function going from about 1,013.2 millibars all the way up to um, 100 here. You can see this big exponential function here. All right, let's take a look at temperature. So the atmosphere is actually divided into four regions based on temperature. You can see here, you can see the tropopause, stratosphere, mesosphere, and thermosphere. Let's take a look at the tropo, uh, troposphere first. So the troposphere in Greek means the changing sphere. This is the lowest layer characterized by decreasing temperature with height. It's a layer where 99% of the weather occurs. It contains 75% of the Earth's uh, atmosphere's mass, as well as 99% of the total water vapor mass. It has an average height of about 18 kilometers in, in the tropics, or 11 miles, and about 17 kilometers, or 10 and a half miles, in the mid-latitudes, and about 6 kilometers, or about 3.73 miles in the polar regions. Average lapse rates, or the fall of temperature, of about 6.5 degrees C per kilometer, or three and a half degrees Fahrenheit per thousand feet. An average temperature uh, of the troposphere is around 59 degrees Fahrenheit. Definitely comfortable. All right, let's move on to the stratosphere. The stratosphere in Greek means the layered sphere. It has an average height of about 20 kilometers, um, about 12.43 miles in the tropics, 10 kilometers, or 6.21 miles in the mid-latitudes, and seven kilometers, or about 4.335 miles in the polar regions. It is characterized by an increase in temperature with height. This is due to absorption of ultraviolet radiation by ozone. Average temperature within the stratosphere is around minus 32 and a half degrees Fahrenheit. Definitely wouldn't want to be up there. Uh, you know, I'd rather, I'd rather be at a nice, comfortable 59 degrees. All right, let's move on to the mesosphere, or in Greek, the middle sphere. This layer is directly above the stratosphere. This is between 50 and 65 kilometers, or between 31.07 and 40.39 miles above the surface. This is where the temperature once again decreases with altitude. Gravity waves commonly exist within this region, as well as planetary waves, which we will get into those later. Average temperatures uh, within the mesosphere are around minus 225 degrees Fahrenheit, which is the coldest portion of the Earth's atmosphere. This is due to decreasing absorption of solar radiation and increasing cooling by carbon dioxide, um, carbon dioxide radiative emission. All right, and lastly here, let's move on to the thermosphere, or in Greek, the heat sphere. 
This is between 80 and 600 kilometers, uh, between 49.7 and 373 miles above Earth's surface. Uh, this uh, sphere, the thermosphere, is largely uninhabited, uh, with the exception of the International Space Station um, orbiting around the Earth. Temperature rises with height due to absorption of ultraviolet radiation by oxygen and nitrogen atoms. Temperatures in this region can reach an astounding 4,530 degrees Fahrenheit during the day. In this region, the aurora borealis usually takes place as well. And moving on, the atmosphere can also be divided further into two separate regions based on composition. We have the homosphere, which is below 80 kilometers or below 49.71 miles. This area is a well-mixed layer due to turbulence and eddy diffusion. Then we also have the heterosphere. This is above 80 kilometers or 49.7 miles. This is a stratified layer or a layer that is separated, um, separated gases by weight. Heavier gases will be near the bottom of this layer. Lighter gases will be near the top. Moving on to the turbopause. This is the area of separation between the homosphere and heterosphere. This usually occurs roughly at 80 kilometers above Earth's surface. And moving on to one of the most interesting layers, in my opinion, which is the ionosphere. This is between 80 and 400 kilometers, or 49.71 miles, and 249 miles above the surface. Characterized by ions, or free electrons, and plasma. So basically what an ion is, an ion is a particle, atom, or molecule with a net negative charge, or positive or negative, it could be an ion as well. This is the area of free electrons, um, these electrons strip from particles by ultraviolet light. And also, this is an area, or region, where plasma can occur. It's the fourth fundamental state of matter, consists of a gas of ions and free electrons. This is the, and also, the ionosphere is the ionized portion of Earth's atmosphere. Uh, plays an important role in atmospheric electricity. Influences radio wave propagation. It exists due to ultraviolet light from the sun. And then lighting below also plays a role in generating sprites and other transient luminous events, or TLEs, in the ionosphere. Just to show you guys plasma as well. Plasma sheets uh, that can develop in Earth's atmosphere as well. As I stated earlier, TLEs, or transient luminous events. Um, these are upper atmospheric lightning phenomenon. Um, they, they take the form of luminous plasma. Other types, um, so we have, let's see here, we have ghosts, this green color. If you want to learn more about TLEs, uh, we're definitely, we might go into this. I think I had, do have a lecture on this later. I'm um, in the series. It's not going to be for a while, but I do have a lecture on this. So if you guys want to learn more about this, definitely stay tuned for that. But if you can't wait for that lecture, definitely go to um, Pesos Hank on YouTube. Um, he is a storm chaser. Uh, definitely, definitely highly recommend him. Um, he definitely uh, gets a lot of amazing shots of transient luminous events. So they take the form of ghosts, blue jets, gigantic jets, pixies. And also, see here, I'm not sure if gnomes are shown here or not, but there also there's also a phenomenon called gnomes. And then we have the troll. And we have blue starters. We also have the elves. And uh, so basically, also transient luminous events um, can also take place um, within Jupiter's upper atmosphere as well. One well, of these lit up regions here, all transient luminous events, uh, basically sort of in the form uh, mostly of sprites. Not sure if they have blue jets and uh, elves there, but definitely some sprites can definitely be seen there. All right, guys, I do hope that you enjoyed this first lecture. It is a sort of brief lecture. Um, however, we will be breaking down and going into more detail of certain aspects. I just want to get the basics out of the way here. So next time, we have uh, lecture two, which is on solar and terrestrial radiation. So basically, we'll talk about the Earth-Sun geometry, the seasons, energy, heat, temperature, some basic physics, 
and definitely the rather interesting Martian sunset. All right, guys. Thank you for joining me during this lecture. I uh, definitely hope that you will um, view the next lecture. And if you want me to include anything or if you have any questions, um, definitely feel free to message me. Thank you very much. Have a good night, guys. Never stop chasing.